Thank you for having me. I'm pleased to speak on the topic of smoking cessation for persons with serious mental illness, what we know and what we can do. This is the outline of my talk. I'm going to be addressing first what we know in terms of the prevalence and consequences of cigarette smoking in this population. Also proposed mechanisms and prevalent myths. Then I'm going to turn to what we can do in terms of smoking cessation treatments, including some innovative approaches such as a peer mentor program for smoking cessation that I have developed, and a program for counseling after a psychiatric admission which I have proposed. What do I mean by serious mental illness? These are adult psychiatric disorders associated with significant impairment in life domains, particularly in thinking, in feeling, mood, ability to relate to others, and or daily functioning. Examples of serious mental illness include schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, recurrent depression, and the other disorders listed here. Most of my work has been focused on adults with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Turning now to the prevalence of smoking, compared with persons in the general population, persons with serious mental illness have a markedly higher prevalence of smoking. They're heavier smokers, they smoke more cigarettes per person, they have longer smoking histories, and they also have a lower rate of quitting and of achieving sustained abstinence. Mental health consumers now dominate the cigarette marketplace in the United States. It's estimated that 44% of all cigarettes sold in the United States are smoked by persons with a mental health disorder, not just persons with serious mental illnesses. Here are some data from our own study populations at Shepherd Pratt that will be familiar to many people in the audience. We have studied the smoking in individuals with schizophrenia, in bipolar disorder, and in our non-psychiatric controls. We were interested in the prevalence of smoking in each of these groups by their year of enrollment in our studies. And they were recruited for our studies without regard for their smoking status because our studies weren't primarily about smoking. It's important to point out that these data are cross-sectional data, they're not longitudinal data. So each person had his or her smoking assessed only once at time of their enrollment into a study. So what's very striking on this slide, looking at the individuals with schizophrenia in blue, for almost every year of study recruitment starting in 1999 and going through 2011, more than 60% of the schizophrenia participants smoke cigarettes. Really staggering numbers. In comparison is the control group in red. These are individuals without a current psychiatric disorder, without any history of psychiatric disorder or any psychiatric treatment. Their overall prevalence of smoking is 19% which happens to match exactly the prevalence of smoking in the U.S. in the adult population per the CDC. In between in smoking prevalence are the individuals with bipolar disorder, shown here in green. Their overall prevalence of smoking is 44 percent, again markedly greater than the individuals without a psychiatric disorder, but much less than the individuals with schizophrenia. What's also really striking about these data is the absence of a time trend for the individuals with schizophrenia. You can see that the prevalence of smoking in the schizophrenia group of people who've signed up for her studies has remained um, essentially constant over the last 12 years, and there is no uh, significant decline. We were also interested in the amount of cigarettes that people smoke, the quantity of cigarettes that they smoke. And here we show the packs per day for our schizophrenia smokers 
by their year of enrollment in our study. Starting in 1999 on the bottom and through 2011 on the top. So it looks like there might be some trend here, some decline, because in 2011 we see a higher percentage who smoke uh, a half a pack or less per day and fewer people who smoke uh, more than a pack a half a day. But in fact, when you include all of the relevant uh, covariates, there is no significant change over time. Again, these are cross-sectional data, not longitudinal data. We were then interested to examine the risk factors for smoking in our seriously uh, mentally ill group as a whole. So that includes individuals with schizophrenia as well as individuals with bipolar disorder. And we performed a multivariate log logistic regression analysis, including all of the factors are shown here on this slide. And what we found was that cigarette smoking was highly correlated with a history of substance abuse, as you would find in the general population, with lower education. Again, this is what we would expect. We also found a significant association with Caucasian race versus African American race, with the duration of psychiatric illness, with male gender, with a diagnosis of schizophrenia versus bipolar disorder consistent with the data I just presented. We did not find a significant association with the total psychiatric symptom score, although other researchers have. And we also did not find an association with maternal education as a proxy for socioeconomic status. Turning now to the consequences of cigarette smoking, which in this population are serious and adverse. We know that cigarette smoking contributes to the excess morbidity and mortality of persons with serious mental illness. For example, individuals with schizophrenia have twice the risk for cardiovascular mortality, three times the risk for pulmonary diseases such as COPD, emphysema, as persons in the general population, and that these illnesses are contributed to by cigarette smoking. Then there are consequences related to the high cost of cigarettes. A pack of cigarettes now costs $5. I just checked it out at my local farm store. And this is a lot of money for people who live on Social Security disability income, as many people do who have serious mental illness. That can be as low as $500 a month to cover all the costs. So it's no uh, surprise that in one study that was done of individuals with schizophrenia, it was found that uh, cigarettes consumed more than one-third of the person's disability income. Then there's the social disapproval and stigma related to smoking. Society is obviously less tolerant of smokers, and individuals with serious mental illness may also be stigmatized for other reasons, and the smoking may just add to it. Cigarette smoking has an effect on the metabolism of psychiatric medications. It can lower the blood level of some antipsychotics, leading to uh, the need for increased medication doses. As in the general population, cigarette smoking is a trigger for other substance use and abuse. And within serious mental illness, cigarette smoking is often associated with more severe psychiatric symptoms and worse mental health outcomes. Data about the excess morbidity and mortality in persons with serious mental illness have been known for some time, but this report really had a major impact. This report was published in 2006 and really was a wake-up call to the mental health community. Because the data are very dramatic, as I'll show you, it was a large study drawing on patients from eight public health state agencies. The data were fairly recent, and they were from the United States. Some previous mortality studies were from Europe, so they were uh, a bit one step removed. And what this report found was that persons with serious mental illness die 25 years younger than the general population based on reports for consumers served by state mental health agencies. Again, there were eight state mental health agencies contributing. 
Male consumers are likely to die at about 53 years and female consumers at 59 years. This 25-year disparity from the general population is due to two factors, chronic physical disabilities, physical illnesses, which account for 15 to 20 years of the difference, and mental disabilities such as suicide. So most of the excess mortality is due to death from natural causes that are contributed to uh, by smoking. We studied mortality in our own patients at Shepherd Pratt, and this was part of a larger study called the Schizophrenia Screening Study, the goal of which was to determine the role of infectious agents and other environmental factors in the etiology of schizophrenia. Participants were adult patients at Shepherd Pratt who had a diagnosis of schizophrenia and who enrolled in our studies. We collected clinical data, including mortality at the time of follow-up, but at baseline we looked at comorbidities, we measured psychiatric and cognitive status, we measured exposures, each participant provided a blood sample from which antibodies to infectious agents were measured, including antibodies to the human herpes viruses and Toxoplasma gondii, a parasite, as well as markers of inflammation and some genetic polymorphisms. So this mortality study was a subset of our schizophrenia screening study in which we included all of these schizophrenia participants enrolled since 1999 and through December 31st, 2009. At follow-up, we were able to obtain information about whether or not the people in our cohort had died, and if so, what was the cause of death, and were able to access good data from the National Death Index. We then used Kaplan-Meier and Cox proportional hazards to look at the role of smoking and other determinants on mortality. So these are the characteristics of our cohort at baseline. It's important to note that their average age was 42 and that 65% of them were smokers. Of the smokers, 30% are what we're calling heavy smokers, smacking smoking at least one pack per day. The mean follow-up interval was 6.3 years, so the cohort went from on average of age 42 to on average age 48, and in that interval, 24 persons died of natural causes, and this was 4.5% of the group. An additional seven individuals died due to unnatural causes, and they were almost all suicides. We see the accrued mortality rates here, and we are in the process of comparing those to rates in the general population. The causes of natural death are not unexpected, with the largest number in the cardiac category. Again, these causes of death were obtained from the actual death certificates from the National Death Index. This is a Kaplan-Meier survival curve showing the unadjusted survival rates by baseline smoking status. And what we see is a markedly lower survival rate among the people who smoked at baseline. We then used Cox proportional hazards analyses to look at the effect of our infectious disease factors and other factors that were predictive of mortality along with cigarette smoking. And among the infectious disease factors, we found the strongest factor was seropositivity to herpes simplex virus type 1, HSV1, at baseline and that this in combination with cigarette smoking at baseline yielded a hazard ratio of more than five in comparison with the lowest risk group for mortality. 
In terms of other factors that we found associated with mortality, other of the infectious disease factors, we found that antibodies to Epstein-Barr virus at baseline were associated with mortality. Antibodies to Toxoplasma gondii at baseline were associated with mortality. But the strongest effect among the infectious disease factors was HSV-1. We also found that age was associated, of course, with mortality, as was female gender. We did not find an effect of race in this sample. So, why do people with serious mental illness smoke so much? What is the explanation? Well, we don't know for sure. We do not know. However, there are biological, psychological, and social mechanisms that have been proposed. Most of the studies have been in genetics looking at associations between a certain genes or polymorphisms and smoking. For example, the NR4A3 gene, which is involved in neurodevelopment, has been associated with smoking behavior in this population. Differences have also been found in the expression of nicotinic acid receptor, protein, and RNA in smokers versus non-smokers. Then there are psychological and social factors that have been posited. It's been found that persons with mental illness who smoke have a stronger belief than do non-mentally ill smokers that smoking somehow helps them cope with stress and enables them to deal with negative mood states. Then there are social factors. Social provide, social, uh, smoking provides an opportunity for social interaction. Some of our uh, seriously uh, mentally ill participants uh, tell us very directly that smoking helps them deal with boredom, that it helps them pass the time. And it's certainly true that persons with mental illness typically spend more time with smokers and in environments that tolerate smoking than do persons in the general population. They may, may be uh, shielded to some extent then from the stigma associated with smoking in many segments of our uh, society. But in fact, we do not know for sure why there is this very high prevalence. There are a number of myths that also contribute to the problem and help perpetuate it. These were very nicely expressed by Judith Prochaska in a recent New England Journal of Medicine article. The first myth is that smoking is necessary self-medication for the mentally ill. Now, it is true that nicotine enhances concentration and attention transiently. It may improve some of the sensory gating deficits that are characteristic of schizophrenia. However, these effects are very subtle, and they are very short-lived. And as a group, individuals who smoke do not show lower levels of psychiatric symptom. In fact, as a group, individuals with mental illness who smoke tend to have more severe symptoms and tend to have worse cognitive functioning. So tobacco use is not a solution. It is a problem. The second myth is that people with mental illness are not interested in quitting. So why bother? Well, in some cases, their motivation may be lower. But people with mental illness, when you talk to them, they know that smoking is bad for them. They know that they should quit. And many of them do understand that their lives would be better and that they would be healthier if they could quit. They just have a really hard time doing so. Recently, I did an informal survey of inpatients at Shepherd Pratt on four of the acute adult units. And it was interesting that almost half of the smokers in that group said that they were seriously interested in quitting within the next six months. Now, they didn't say that they were interested in quitting now, but they did say that they were interested in quitting. The third myth is that mentally ill people cannot quit smoking. So why bother helping them to do so? 
Well, this is certainly untrue because there are numerous clinical trials of smoking cessation interventions that, that have been carried out with individuals with schizophrenia mostly. And as a group, these interventions do show a benefit. And some of the people in these studies do stop smoking and are able to maintain abstinence. The fourth myth that quitting smoking worsens psychiatric symptoms is probably the most pervasive and it's the hardest one to debunk. Many mental health providers and patients themselves really don't want to address smoking in part because they don't want to rock the boat. What if I reduce or quit and it makes my symptoms worse? Or the doctor who says, you know, I just got them stable on these meds. I really don't want to do anything that would jeopardize that stability. And this attitude is understandable, except there is really no evidence that reducing or quitting smoking leads to an exacerbation of psychiatric symptoms, that it leads to a psychotic relapse or a relapse of depression. It certainly is true that craving for nicotine and that withdrawal can be accompanied by uncomfortable symptoms, but these tend to be short-lived. They can be addressed with nicotine replacement therapy and it is not the same as having a new psychotic episode. In fact, most smoking cessation trials that have been done in schizophrenia and other uh, persons with serious mental illness have very carefully tracked the psychiatric symptoms of the participants because of this concern. And virtually all of the studies have found that persons with mental illness who are engaged in smoking cessation treatment show an improvement in their psychiatric symptoms. And in fact, they also uh, feel that they're more on the path to their own mental illness or recovery and are, a gen are, are generally grateful for having been able to uh, cut back or quit. The final myth is that smoking cessation treatment is not important in mental health care. And certainly, historically, smoking has not been addressed in mental health settings and it's been seen as a very low priority because there are so many other pressing issues, the patient's immediate symptoms and their psychiatric medicines and perhaps suicidality and, and issues around housing and other social issues. But in fact, it is now increasingly recognized because of the morbidity and mortality in this population, which has such a profound effect on quality of life that uh, smoking is important to address. There are more calls uh, to action to do so, but that it is certainly not standard in mental health settings. I was interested in finding people with mental illness who had successfully quit, in part as a counter to some of these myths, because most of the studies that have been done have looked at people with mental illness who smoke and have found all the reasons that they do smoke. But very few people have looked at the people who have quit and tried to understand their experiences and their motivations. So I went around to find successful quitters. And to do so, I visited a number of day psychiatric rehabilitation programs in the Baltimore area, of which there are a number. And I went to each of these programs and I spoke to the group of people attending at a at a community meeting, and I asked for a show of hands of people who currently smoke, and most people raised their hands. Then I asked who in the room had never smoked, and a sizable number of people raised their hands, as would be true in the general population, at least 25%, maybe even 30% of the people. And then I asked who here used to smoke and has been able to quit? And invariably, a number of hands went up, a sprinkling of hands, and those were the people that I was able then to interview individually. They were mostly people with schizophrenia. They were severely ill and that they attended a day program, which is really only for the most severely ill psychiatric patients. Their mean duration of smoking was very impressive. They'd smoked on average 25 years. 
And they had also, uh, for the most part, given it up for a fairly long time. The mean duration of abstinence was more than seven years. So the group as a whole, they were well-established ex-smokers. So I asked them, each of them, why did you stop smoking? What, what, what led you to do this? And the most commonly cited reason, not surprisingly, was a health problem or a health concern. They said things like, you know, I was hospitalized for pneumonia, or I saw a family member die of lung cancer and that was really scary, or I found that I couldn't breathe. The second most cited reason had to do with the cost of cigarettes. Again, $5 a pack is a lot of money. And then the other reasons listed here on this slide. So then I asked them, well, what enabled you to quit? How did you do it? Because we hadn't had a smoking cessation intervention in their center. What tools did you use? What treatment did you use? And most of them quit without any formal smoking cessation treatment. 30% had used nicotine replacement therapy and a much smaller percentage had been any, in any kind of a smoking cessation group or had uh, received uh, bupropion or varenicline, other smoking cessation medicines. Very few, or just a handful, had used a quit line. Turning now to the treatments to promote smoking cessation in this population, I've mentioned the medications. Bupropion is now indicated in our port of treatment recommendations for schizophrenia for people with schizophrenia who want to uh, reduce or quit smoking. There have been uh, clinical trials. And that it's effective uh, with or without nicotine replacement therapy. The safety and efficacy of varenicline has not been established in this population. It's a very effective smoking, uh, smoking cessation medication, but um, because it has psychiatric side effects, it is uh, typically not recommended for persons with serious mental illness. Then there are psychosocial interventions that have been used uh, in the general population. These include quit lines, an American Lung Association program. There are others. There's also NIC Anonymous. It's parallel to AA, a self-help group for people who have quit smoking. Then there are specialized interventions for persons with serious mental illness, specialized uh, psychosocial interventions, cognitive behavioral interventions. And then there are a number of innovative approaches that have been uh, developed or proposed, this peer support program that I'm going to talk about, and a telephone counseling program for after hospital discharge that I have proposed. This is from the Maryland Quit Line website. Quit lines are now available in all US states and I think also in Canada and other places around the world and are typically uh, provided at no cost. A tobacco user or their provider may initiate contact with a quit line. Services include typically four, five, or six proactive counseling calls with a quit coach. NRT may also be provided, sent by mail. The caller is encouraged to set a quit date typically within 30 days of the initial call to remove all smoking paraphernalia from their home prior to the quit, to strive for total abstinence, and to anticipate triggers or challenges. Quit lines are a wonderful resource and their effectiveness has been well established for persons in the general population. However, for persons with serious mental illness, for schizophrenia, the benefit has not clearly been established and these people may need a more tailored approach and, a, and or a more intensive approach to successfully address their smoking. There are clearly challenges in promoting smoking cessation in this population. As I've mentioned, a uh, lower motivation uh, to quit than in the general population uh, sometimes. 
There are typically ongoing psychiatric symptoms and treatments. And there are the uh, myths that I've presented that uh, perpetuate the problem. There are also uh, facilitating factors. There's now increasing concern about somatic health status and about the uh, excess mortality, which is due in part to smoking. Patients now talk about this, families talk about this, mental health providers talk about this. Then there are increasing environmental restrictions. Shepherd Pratt is now a completely smoke-free campus. And there's the high cost of cigarettes, all of which serve as deterrents. So what about quit rates in response to smoking cessation interventions? Well, if you look at the studies, the outcomes vary widely. Typically, the quit rate at the end of the study is somewhere between 15 and 50 percent. The average is probably 20 percent. And of course, a lower uh, rate of quitting at a follow-up point. I mentioned some specialized interventions that have been developed for persons with mental illness to help them quit. This is a group intervention that was developed primarily by Melanie Bennett and Lisa Dixon at the University of Maryland, along with uh, some others of us. And it starts with motivational enhancement. This is a discussion of the positive and the negative aspects of smoking, trying to be neutral, non-confrontational, non-adversarial, and then eliciting the individual's personal reasons for quitting because it's only with an understanding of personal reasons that the individual is likely to be successful. Each session starts with goal setting, identifying some very particular target for the next few days or week around smoking, possibly cutting out one cigarette at one certain time in anticipation of a quit date. Sessions are focused on skills training, on strategies for quitting smoking, strategies for coping with negative mood states, how to avoid triggers in high-risk situations, and these discussions are tailored for persons with mental illness. There's also education about smoking and certainly about smoking cessation medications, and then contingency management. This is contingency monetary reinforcement for having a low level of expired carbon monoxide, which is measured with this instrument, a smokerizer or breathalyzer, and a reading of eight parts per million or less, which shows on that screen, is consistent with not having smoked in the past four or five hours. So it's just the recent time period of not smoking. But for such a low reading, we pay participants a, a small amount of money, and then the amount of money increases with the number of consecutive low reads across group sessions. And the patients really um, enjoy this, even if they don't blow below eight. So I developed a peer mentor enhancement to this smoking cessation program. So what, what's a peer mentor? Well, that's a person with serious mental illness who has also successfully quit smoking. Peer mentors then have similar experiences or some similar life experiences as the individuals they serve. They understand mental illness, they understand mental illness treatments, in some cases they're on the same medications as the persons they're working with, and they certainly understand smoking and the struggles of giving up smoking. They have a demonstrated capacity to be able to cope with their own mental illness, and it's on that basis in part that we select them. They are trained for the counseling role, and then assigned specific roles and responsibilities. So why would we develop this kind of a peer mentor program? Well, we know that interventions for quitting smoking in this population have had only limited success, and certainly, as I've shown, smoking remains really, really prevalent, so we need to ramp up our efforts. 
Also, peer support and social support are well established in substance abuse interventions and for some a medical intervention based on the fact that people who have endured and overcome adversity themselves can offer support, encouragement, hope, and mentorship to others facing similar situations. So this is the structure of our peer mentor program. Again, they enhance the professionally-led quit smoking group that I described. The group meets twice a week for 12 weeks, almost three months. We also provide directly nicotine replacement therapy. The peers assist in the group sessions. They actually help with the breathalyzer. And they deliver focused testimonials about their own experience related to the topic of the group. The peers meet with participants individually between group sessions. And so far, we have four peer mentors. And each peer mentor has two to three mentees. And they maintain very careful records of their interactions with their participants. So they meet with their participants during the time that the group is underway. And they also meet with them then for an additional three months after the group has concluded. And that's just the phase we're in right now in our first iteration of this approach. Our peer mentors are paid part-time employees of Shepherd Pratt, and they proudly wear their Shepherd Pratt employee badges. They also participate in weekly group supervision with me and other of the research staff. This slide shows some of the measures that we are collecting and will be collecting in the course of the study. We're very interested in their knowledge and skills after the peer mentor training, and we assess that after the 28-hour training, which we provided for them. And part of the assessment involved their performance on role play tests. We're interested in the fidelity of their performance of the peer program, and we do ratings based on video recordings of the groups. We're interested in the feasibility and acceptability of the program. How welcomed are they by the group participants? How many meetings do they actually have with their group participants? We want to know about the impact of the program on the peers themselves, as well as on the group participants. And of course, ultimately, we're interested in the smoking outcomes of the participants, hoping to improve them. So what have we found so far? Our observations are, by definition, preliminary because we're only in the uh, uh, first phase of this project and implementing the peer program for the first time. Well, we've been really impressed by the capacity of these peers to perform in the peer mentor role despite their own mental illness symptoms. We had one peer mentor who early on uh, took a two-week leave of absence to enroll herself in a day hospital program for her own symptoms, and then she came back and didn't miss a beat. We've been impressed with their partnering and collaborating with us we weren't quite sure how it was going to go. Initially, we thought that the peer mentors would kind of enter the intervention when the group started, and they would sort of appear at the first group and participate at that point. Then we realized, as we were planning this, that it made sense just to have them involved in all aspects of the research and to even help prepare the study and to help recruit the participants, which they were able to do. We've been struck with the quality of their interactions with the participants. They are truly uh, caring and accepting and tolerant and patient. And I've come to believe even more strongly that they can relate at a different level than I can and other traditional professionals. We've had a few challenges. Uh, some of the peer mentors, some of the time, have had difficulty maintaining this motivational interviewing protocol stanch which again is sort of non-directive and non-judgmental and non-adversarial because they just really want them to stop smoking and so they kind of rush in a little more than um, we would. We've also struggled to define the peer role boundaries. I mean, it's a lot harder than those of us who are in office-based practice where um, things are kind of defined for you. And one of the issues we've come up with um, 
having to decide is whether or not the peer mentors should meet with the group participants in the participants' homes or residences. And there are argues for this and there are argues against it, and we have decided for now that the answer is no. And we have come to uh, realize, as we knew all along, that even with the most wonderful peer mentors, that there is no quick fix to enable people with serious mental illness to quit smoking. I wanted to end by telling you about another innovative uh, intervention. This is one that I have proposed. I just submitted it for funding last week, so it has not yet uh, been implemented. This is an innovative telephone intervention to promote smoking cessation after a psychiatric admission. By way of background, we know that smoking is generally correlated with psychiatric illness severity. So it's no surprise that patients admitted to a psychiatric unit or to a psychiatric hospital are uh, very uh, likely to be smokers even more than persons in an outpatient setting because it's more severely ill patients generally who are admitted to the hospital. This hospital admission actually uh, provides a critical opportunity in that the hospital environment is now completely smoke free. There are no smoke breaks, no smoking porches, no smoke walks. The entire environment is smoke free and all persons, all patients have enforced abstinence uh, throughout the hospital stay. They're also available for health related programming because they're in the hospital for one to two weeks generally. Current practice is that nicotine replacement therapy is liberally provided during the hospital stay, and I was talking before how we collect information about who's a smoker and who's not at admission deliberately so that this NRT can be provided, and nicotine inhalers are really provided on demand. However, there is typically no referral for post-discharge smoking cessation treatment, nor any NRT prescribed for after the hospital stay. And we see this as a missed opportunity. So what we are proposing is to engage patients when they are in the hospital, engage them around smoking cessation. They're already undergoing a successful quit, albeit an enforced one, and they're already generally using NRT. So this is an opportunity to lay the groundwork, to set the stage, for a telephone counseling intervention after hospital discharge. We also propose to use an existing smartphone app adapted to the intervention and also to provide NRT. In preparation for this study, we reviewed existing smartphone apps that are based on the Android operating system. So we went to the Google store and identified several hundred smoking cessation apps, of which 85 were actually accessible. Then we imposed some additional inclusion ex exclusion criteria for these apps. And um, for example, we, we wanted apps that addressed people who were trying to quit as well as those who had already quit. And we excluded apps that had punishing language and misspellings and that were really um, kind of on the face of it undesirable. And we found 16 apps that met our criteria that were then uh, downloaded for further review. We rated each app on the extent to which it was consistent in its content with evidence-based smoking cessation guidelines. We also recorded the number of installs which is also reflective of how long it's been on the market. And these were the top five. Then I contacted the, the developers of some of these apps, which led to some very interesting conversations. And ultimately, we selected the first app shown here to be used in our study. That concludes my talk for today. I've shown that the prevalence of cigarette smoking remains alarmingly high among persons with serious mental illness, 
and is associated with the excess mortality in this population. It's important to note that people with mental illness are interested in quitting and that they can stop smoking. However, challenges remain and innovative approaches are needed. I would like to thank my colleagues and co-investigators, some of whom are here. And this work was done with funding uh, by the Stanley Medical Research Institute and also from NIH NIDA. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? I'll start. Good. <laughs> Yes. What are your peer support? Yes, we are providing NRT. Some of the other psychosocial interventions have not directly provided NRT, but only encouraged people to use it. And we realized that there were barriers for these people to use NRT, like cost. And if you had five dollars, would you spend it on NRT or a pack of cigarettes? Oftentimes it would be a pack of cigarettes. So we were able to partner with the Baltimore County Health Department and work through some administrative complexities. And they actually have provided to us three NRT products, the patch, the lozenge, and gum. And we have a study nurse who meets individually with study participants as part of the group or as before or after the group. And we very much encourage use of NRT. Our, our first full quit was someone who used the patch and I don't know that he would have accessed it so readily had we not provided it. And I think Baltimore City has a similar program through the health department. So it, it, it is a very, a, very, um, a very helpful resource. Other questions? Right. I wonder what the covariate that you had there was pets. So what is that? Really well, this is very interesting, and some of the people in this room are involved in this aspect of the research. There is uh, an association that we are interested in, possibly between pet ownership and exposure to certain exp uh, to certain infectious disease agents. For example, uh, uh, ownership of cats or exposure to cats and and uh, being toxoplasma a Gandhi positive. So we are asking questions about uh, pet exposures, but also exposures uh, to other environmental factors, because we're interested in environmental factors more generally that may then be uh, consistent with antibody responses that may be involved in some way in the etiology of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. So we're, we're, we're trying to measure as many exposures as we can, including dietary exposures. In other words, cigarette smoking doesn't, <laughs> but the so bird does. Now, actually, we, we, we haven't looked at the uh, pet ownership in terms of cigarette smoking, but that would be interesting for us to look at, and, and we could. I don't think we've assessed whether they uh, had a pet bird either. We basically focused on cats and dogs. <laughs> Absolutely. And, um, you know, and this group, these groups in particular are not exposed to our most effective tobacco control policies. That's right. Smoke through workplaces if they're not working. Exactly. Um, cigarette taxes, you know, because they can buy Lucy's or get, well, you might not always be buying, you know, a pack of cigarettes, other ways of, of getting price um, caught up. So um, we, we, you know, it's great that you're Well, we hope that they would be more exposed to the public health messages. 
And uh, one thing we are considering with some of my colleagues in the room is how we might actually try and, try and uh, help influence changes in the environment of these uh, psychiatric rehabilitation programs, which look like our workplaces did 30 years ago with people congregating around the door smoking, frequently exiting the building to smoke, um, and, and they just really haven't kept a pace with the um, environmental policies that most of us are now very used to. So we're, we're hoping to help change that as a way to further promote smoking cessation. Can I ask one other question? Sure. Um, so I know historically um, within the health care provider That is a very interesting question, and I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that question, but that's a very interesting question. I can tell you, I don't think I have any psychiatrist colleagues who smoke. The prevalence of smoking among U.S. physicians is 3%, unless it's gone down since I last uh, heard that data. I, 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 I would think that psychiatrists are similar now to other physicians. You really don't see doctors in psychiatric settings uh, smoking in, in the United States, in my personal experience. Um, as, as, you, um, as you look at other professional groups, you do, and one of the issues in the psychosocial day programs and even uh, in our hospital programs at Shepherd Pratt are the mental health workers, the rehab counselors, the, the uh, quote-unquote paraprofessionals, who some of them do smoke, and how to influence them to quit smoking in part for their own health and also because of the positive influence that would then have on the patients. So it is still an issue, but I don't think it's an issue at the doctor level, unless anyone here thinks otherwise. <sighs> Yes. To look at the uh, psychiatrists who smoke, yeah. I, I bet there is psychiatrists. Oh, 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 sorry. I should repeat the question. Is there any longitudinal data available to look at this issue? I, I, I suspect there is. I, I'm sure that there um, have tracked the smoking prevalence among physicians, certainly when doctors used to participate in camel ads, you know, smoking keeps my lungs healthy, to the current time. How much it's done by specialty, I'm not sure, but I bet that data are available and would be very interesting. Yes. That's a, that's a very good question. We, in this first iteration, were not looking at that so closely, so I can't really say. I don't think that anyone's gotten dramatically worse. We've had people who've had issues along the way and people whose psychiatric status is, is pretty symptomatic, but we really haven't studied that. The data that I was drawing on comes from these randomized controlled trials of smoking cessation interventions that mine is not, and they have looked really carefully at psychiatric data throughout the course of the trial in the people receiving the active arm as well as those in the control arm. And, and I think the data is pretty convincing because it's across so many different studies that the treatment actually is associated, if anything, with improvement. But, but I, can't, I can't provide my own data yet about that. Thank you. I look forward to hearing the results. Okay. Of <laughs>